Hey, what's up everyone? So today we are once again going to talk about a feature of Swift that is both very powerful, but also we could say not that well known and is the ability for an initializer to fail. So as always, I'm going to paste in some code in order to set up some context. So as you can see, I have pasted a struct. It's a very simple struct. So the struct represents a user. And in this user, we have two properties, a username and a password. And as you can see, I have an init, which is a member-wise initializer. But still, there is one subtlety in this init, is that as you can see, I have called the argument candidate password and not directly password. And the reason behind it is that, well, in the init, I'm going to want to run some checks in order to make sure that the password does satisfy some rules. And by that, I mean rules like not being too simple, being of a given length at minimum, containing special characters, that kind of rules. And as you can imagine, well, as soon as I start trying to enforce these rules inside my init, well, I need a way for my init to fail because it then becomes possible that given a set of arguments, well, I will not be able to carry out the initiation process to its end. So let's see what this failable init could look like. So first, I'm going to implement a first test on the candidate password. So as you can see, I'm using a guard statement. And in this guard statement, well, I want to make sure that the password is at least four characters long. So it's a rule that makes sense. But as you know, as soon as I write a guard statement, well, I must also provide an else clause in order to say what must happen when the condition has not been satisfied. So what am I going to do inside this else clause? Well, if we were in a regular function, the logical reflex would be to return nil. So something like this. And this is actually exactly what we are going to do. So it might seem weird to return nil inside an initializer, but it's actually perfectly legal. I just need to change the signature, so the declaration of the initializer a little bit, and I need to add a question mark just after the keyword in it. And just by doing this, now my initializer has become a failable initializer, meaning that the init can indeed fail. And when it does fail, it will return nil instead of a fully initialized instance of user. So now it's time to actually use this syntax in order to see, well, what does the call site look like? So as you can see, the way I call the init is exactly the same than if it were not a failable init. The only difference is that since my init can now fail, well, if I do an option click on the variable user, we can see that now the variable user is of type optional user and not just user, which makes total sense when we consider the fact that now our initializer can fail and can return nil. So as you can see, this is a great syntax because it's fairly easy to use. It doesn't change the call site that much, and it allows us to implement some checks inside an initializer. But what were to happen if we were to implement, well, several checks inside the same initializer? So I'm going to implement a second test on my password. And so as you can see, this time, I want to make sure that the password does not contain a trivial numerical sequence, like having the integers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 next to each other. So I have implemented my test. And just as before, I need to provide an else clause for my guard statement. So what am I going to do inside this else clause? So right now, I don't really have a choice. I have to return nil because it is my own only way to inform the caller that there has been a failure inside in it. But we can see that now the solution is not that right because at the call site, it becomes impossible for us to know what is the reason behind the failure of the init. Is it because this check failed? Is it because that check failed? We don't know. And it's actually an issue because most of the time, well, we want to know why the initializer failed because we want to display on the screen an informative error message. So how should we proceed when an initializer can fail for more than one reason? Well, we are actually going to use another of Swift built-in mechanism, which is error throwing. So I'm going to add some possible errors to my code. So as you can see, I have added an enum, which conforms to the protocol error. And there are two possible cases in this error, too short and too simple. And now I'm going to modify my init. So it's no longer going to be an init that can return nil. So I'm going to remove the question mark. And instead, I'm going to declare my init as throwing. So init are also allowed to throw, just like any other method in Swift. And now what's going to happen is that instead of returning nil when an error happens, instead, I'm actually going to throw the correct error. So as you can see, when the first test fail, I return an error that explicitly states that indeed the password is too short. And the same thing goes for the second check. 
And now at the call side, well, I'm going to have to also rework my call site in order to be able to catch the error. So as you can see, I have reworked my call site. I have added a do statement and a catch clause in order to get the error if an error is thrown and be able to react accordingly. So here in this case, I'm just going to print the error. But in an iOS app, of course, you would display a message on the screen informing the user why the password that he has entered is not valid. So we have seen the two syntaxes in Swift when we want to have a failable init. The the first one is to enable the init to return nil, and the second one is to enable the init to throw an error. We've seen that the first syntax returning nil is very nice whenever there is only one possibility for the init to fail because it's a very, we could say, well, lightweight syntax. And we've also seen that when there are multiple causes for errors, well, init can become throwing, and this way they are able to return an error that will precisely inform the caller on what went wrong. And before we end, I want to show you one last subtlety at the call site is that when we have an init that throws, so an init that precisely reports which error has happened, well, it might be that we are actually not interested in the error and we just want to have nil when an error has been thrown. Well, what's really nice is that even though the init can no longer return nil, it's still possible to get the same behavior. And we just have to use at the call site, the try question mark operator. And the way this operator works is that it allows us to call a method that can throw. And if an error is thrown, it will discard the error and instead just return nil. And what's really nice with this syntax is that in the instances where we actually don't care for the exact error, well, we don't have to write an entire do catch syntax. We can just use this lightweight operator and have a nice lightweight syntax. And that's it. This time we are done. It's the end of the video. Thank you for watching it and see you next time.